Okay, so we're going to look at spread 2C, the neuron first, and then go back to 2B, which is the spinal reflex. So we've already covered um, what the neuron is in unit one and two. It's the basic um, functional unit of the nervous system. It's the medium through which all your neural impulses or all your neural messages kind of travel. Um, okay, and basically without neurons, we would not be able to um, move, we would not be able to experience sensation. Um, all of these responses that we do every day would not be possible. Okay, so that's basically just a quick introduction into what the neuron is. Um, you would all remember this diagram. It's the same diagram from unit one and two. You need to know all those kind of main key features of the neuron, the dendrites, the myelin sheet, the axon, the axon terminals, really important to know these particular um, components or key features of the neuron. Sometimes when you look at diagrams of neurons online, or if you type in image of a neuron in Google, you will come across um, other terminologies like nodes of Ranvier or Schwann cells. You can just ignore those. Those are not examinable as per your study design, so you will not be required to know about those. So don't worry about those, but um, do kind of focus on the main components that are listed in this diagram here, um, as well as the ones that are explained in the next slide, which are basically the same thing. Also need to know, and I think we did cover this last year as well, but whenever we refer to the sending neuron and the receiving neuron, we don't just call them sending neuron, receiving neuron, that's a bit too simplistic. We call them the presynaptic neuron for the sending, Okay, and the postsynaptic neuron is the receiving neuron. So try to get used to using that terminology because that is kind of key terminology there, okay, that we would normally require you guys to use and to be familiar with. Okay, so again, you need to be able to label um, a neuron like this, which I think we've done many times um, in year 11, unit you know, one and two psychology. And those of you in year 11 this year or who, did, who were in year 10 pre VCEs, like you've covered this there, there as well. Okay, so um, when you look at the um, neuron, you've got all these different components and this kind of gives you um, a little insight into the function of each one, knowing that the impulse or the message travels down the axon and the axon is kind of this stick-like structure that we can see. Um, the myelin is kind of like this white kind of fatty waxy covering. It kind of protects the message from interference there, okay? Um, and we've got a further definition of each of those um, components and their functions on this slide here. So just remembering um, the definitions of each of these, these are the main ones listed in the study design. Um, so you need to understand the structure of these, as well as the overall um, kind of main components of the neuron, like myelin and the axon terminals and that kind of stuff. Okay, so that's the basic um, idea remembering that axons send the message or they transmit the message and dendrites receive. So you can use the memory tip AS doctor to basically remember that. So axons send, dendrites receive. Okay, that's the basic idea. Um, the synapses are the gap between two neurons onto which the neurotransmitter is released. It kind of acts like a site of communication. Okay, and the neurotransmitters themselves are chemical substances. Okay, and these chemical substances are released from at the axon terminal or more specifically from vesicles. Vesicles are like little pouches um, within the axon terminal that um, when the message reaches the axon terminal, those pouches or those vesicles kind of press down and release the axon, um, release the neurotransmitter into the synapse. Okay, so this is kind of difficult to understand without the use of a diagram. So we'll go on to the next slide and show you guys, we'll come back to the label one. Um, I'll show you guys a quick um, image of a diagram of a neuron or two neurons communicating with one another. So you can see here, this is our sending neuron. Can anyone remember what's another word for the sending neuron? If you remember, put it in the chat box. What's the other key word that we use to describe a sending neuron? Presynaptic, excellent. Okay, so this is kind of a presynaptic neuron in this, in this instance. Okay, and obviously the one that comes after the neuron, okay, is going to be our post synaptic post meaning after okay pre meaning before post meaning after so you've got two neurons here they're both communicating with one another you can see this is a close-up of the synapse or what's happening at the synaptic level so you can see all these kind of little dots in the middle okay and we have the word synaptic cleft here just remember the word synaptic cleft is just another way of saying the word synaptic gap 
Okay, it's the same thing. Synapse, synaptic cleft, synaptic gap, all of those are just referring to the same thing, which is the gap between the two neurons, okay, onto which the neurotransmitter is released. Um, speaking of neurotransmitter, all these little dots that you can see here are representing neurotransmitters. And you can see some of them are being released into the synaptic gap as well, okay? Um, so that's just a really um, kind of close up or just a really basic example. Now, whenever we have a neural pathway of information, um, a neural pathway is chains of neurons. So not just one presynaptic with a postsynaptic, but more and more. So you've got like a connection happening where more and more neurons are communicating with one another. So if you've got, this is neuron, let's just label it neuron A. Neuron A communicates with neuron B. Neuron B then communicates with neuron C then D, then E. And it's like a chain of neurons that are connected and that are communicating with one another is what we call as a neural pathway, okay? And whenever we say we have a good memory of something, what we're really saying is we have a good neural pathway that represents that information, okay? And we'll learn more about this when we do learning, um, when we do the topic of learning in outcome two. Um, but we don't need to focus too much on that. So there is a question about what is the soma? The soma is just, um, if I go back here so I can show you, oh, wait, we've already got on this slide. Um, if you look at the soma, the soma is basically the area or the initial processing region. So when a message comes in, for example, um, the dendrites of this um, neuron will be receiving some message, yeah? So if this is neuron B, neuron B will receive a message from, let's say there's a neuron here, neuron A, yeah? That message will come here. And that message will be received through the dendrites. And then when it is received through the dendrites and enters the neuron, it basically stays within the soma. The soma kind of does the initial processing or is the initial holding site for the message before the message starts traveling through that kind of tunnel-like axon that we talked about. Okay, so you can talk, think of the soma as just an initial processing site for the message once it initially enters into the um, neuron. That's just a basic definition that you can include. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that is basically what we're talking about when we're talking about um, neural pathways, okay? So if you guys have any confusions, just feel free to let me know in the chat box. I can explain that a bit more. Um, in terms of uh, neurons, I'm just going to go back. Okay. In terms of actual um, neurons, you need to know about three types of neurons. So we talked about sensory neurons, we talked about motor neurons, and we talked about interneurons. Um, before we look at those, though, you just need to understand the general process of how um, a message travels from one neuron to the next. Okay, We know the brain is made up of all these nerve cells or basic functional units called neurons. Those neurons allow us to send information or receive information um, that basically allow us to uh, experience sensation as well as initiate movement okay we know that once the message comes into the uh, neuron we know that it's going to be processed in the cell body for some time so it comes in through the dendrite goes to the um, soma which is kind of like a processing site or a kind of waiting room once it's been processed that message will then travel through the axon okay and it will eventually go towards the axon terminals. Once the axon terminals sense or recept that a message has, um, has kind of arrived, um, the vesicles or the pouches within those axon terminals or the terminal buttons will press down and will release neurotransmitter into the synaptic gap. And we say the neurotransmitter is kind of like a carrier for information. It facilitates the sending of the message because what our message does is that it then kind of binds or attaches itself to the neurotransmitter. And then that allows it to very quickly travel to the next neuron in that chain or in that pathway. Okay, so that's the basic idea. Obviously the myelin sheath that surrounds the axon makes sure that the message was able to travel through that axon as swiftly and as smoothly as possible with no kind of outside interference. Um, so you can see here in this little cartoony kind of diagram, you can see that the processing happens in the soma or the cell body. And once the processing is done, so this is kind of like the soma, once the processing is done, you can see the message kind of starting to travel through the axon. So think of the men with the papers as the neural impulse or the message that we're talking about. Okay. Um, obviously the synapse is the side of communication. So you can see when the message has reached the synapse, okay, you can see neurotransmitters are coming into the picture and you can see that the message is going to be sent across. Um, 
yeah, I think I've already explained everything else here. We won't worry too much about excitatory or inhibitory effect. That's going to be covered in spread 2D when we look at the two types of neurotransmitters. Um, but yeah, that's the basic idea. And eventually the dendrites in the next neuron or the postsynaptic neuron will receive that message. So you can see the little hands that are sticking out of the postsynaptic membrane there. Those are kind of symbolizing your dendrites, okay? Um, which is the component of the neuron that receives the message, okay? And they often look like, in most diagrams, they do look like tree branch extent extension. So you can see they kind of look a bit like tree branches there, okay? So that's a very uh, kind of simplified explanation of how neural transmission or neural communication works. And you don't need to know anything beyond this level of complexity there. Okay, uh, I think that covers neurons or the main types of neurons. Um, cool. So now what we need to do is we're going to go all the way back now to um, spinal reflex to 2B. The main reason I wanted to cover neurons first is because uh, covering that first helps you to understand this a little more clearer. Okay, now before we start, can anyone um, name to me the three types of neurons that we talked about in unit one and two? Just from memory, if you remember. There are three types of neurons that are really important that allow us to basically do everything every day that we, all the tasks, all the functions. And we used a memory tip as well to remember these. Yep, sensory is one, motor is the other, and uh, interneuron is the last one. Good. So guys, if you remember, we used a memory tip called um, SAME. You can actually change this memory tip if you want and write S-R-A-I-M-E. This one basically is incorrect spelling of same, but it's basically includes the interneuron as well. So we say sensory neurons are afferent neurons and motor neurons are efferent neurons. What that basically means is that if I'm talking about somebody doing a movement, I can say that motor neurons are traveling from the person's brain down the spinal cord to help them move their hand. Or I can say efferent neurons travel down the person's um, spinal cord to their hand to allow them to move. So they're the same thing. Motor equals efferent and sensory equals afferent. Okay, so this memory tip will help you to make sure you don't get mixed up as to which one is which, okay? Today, we're gonna to look at interneurons. Does anyone remember the function of um, interneurons from unit one? Well, what, is, what are interneurons in the first place? So interneurons are, yeah, between neurons, okay? So inter means between, neuron is neuron. So interneurons are basically neurons that allow um, a message to be, or a connection to be made between a sensory and motor neuron, particularly when that message has to be sent very, very, very quickly, where there's not enough time for the message to reach the brain. So that message has to be initiated within the spinal cord itself. Now, this is mostly applicable with reference to reflexes or reflexive movements. And that's what we're going to talk about today with reference to the spinal reflex. Okay. Now, before we look at the actual spinal reflex and what's involved, we need to understand that all responses that we do, all kinds of movements that we engage in every day can be divided into two main categories. The first one is called a conscious response and the second one is called an unconscious response. Now the spinal reflex that we're going to look at today in a little bit of depth is an example of an unconscious response and we'll talk about why this is in a second. However, conscious responses are responses where you are aware of the sensory stimulus as the first key word. Okay, you've paid attention to that sensory stimulus. Okay, your behavior is then voluntary, which means that you have a choice in your behavior. Sometimes your behavior is goal directed because you behave or you act in order to achieve an objective or to achieve a goal. And for that reason, we also say that a conscious response is in that person's uh, conscious control or that person is able to exercise control over that behavior willingly or through their own freedom or through their own free choice. Examples of conscious responses we can see in the image here are picking up a cup of coffee, which you've made, okay, um, can also be picking up a highlighter to highlight some points in your PowerPoint. Okay, so those are just two examples. Now, can anyone think of another example of a conscious response that you do every day? Okay, reading this definition and trying to think of an example of another conscious response that you do every day. And you can just put it in the chat box.
Yes, and there's a question, is the difference that the conscious one is not a reflex whereas not? Yes, that's correct. That's a good, um, good way to differentiate. So the conscious response is never reflexive, never reflexive in the sense that we always have a choice. We can always think about it and um, uh, it's a deliberate action. Whereas an unconscious response is usually initiated by our body. We don't have much of a choice in terms of when it happens or how it happens. It just happens as a kind of survival mechanism to protect us. Yeah. So, um, yep. So I've got some examples here in the chat box. So yeah, eating is one of them. What could be another conscious response? Picking up a bottle of water if you're thirsty. Yep, that's a good one. What else? Just think about any action that you have to think about before doing. If you can think of a movement related action that you need to think about before doing, that will be an example of a conscious response. Okay, if I think about me in a classroom, picking up a duster, picking up a whiteboard marker, um, you know, using my swipe to open the door. So all of those things are conscious responses. They don't happen automatically. I have to think about it and the motor message has to start in the brain and then go down to my hand to allow the movement to occur. That's why those are conscious responses. Joining a Zoom for psychology, opening your laptop to join the Zoom, exactly. That just doesn't happen automatically. You have to think about it. So good, those are some good examples. Okay, now unconscious responses are the complete opposite of a conscious response. Unconscious responses are things like your reflexes, spinal reflex, but any reflexive action, guys. So if, for example, um, it's a really windy day and dust goes into your eyes, what are you going to do? What's the reflexive response that your body initiates at that point when dust goes into your eyes? Starts with the letter B. Come on, guys. It's easy peasy. Yeah, blinking, exactly. So blinking or, you know, um, you start blinking quite rapidly. And that's because that's your body's mechanism of, you know, blinking to get the foreign substance or the foreign material out of your eye so that your eye can be clear again. Okay, the minute something as tiny as an eyelash goes into your eye, it feels like there's some kind of huge foreign substance in your eye, but you look at it and you're like, oh, it was just an eyelash, but it really does affect you. Okay, and blinking is our body's automatic response to get rid of some kind of foreign substance that's come into the eye to make sure that you are protected and that you are safe and that your eye is not going to be damaged or compromised there. Okay, so unconscious responses are really important because although, yeah, we don't have a lot of choice over how they happen or when they happen, um, they are important for our survival, okay? And the spinal reflex is very important for our survival, which I'll talk about very soon as well, okay? If we were to actually think about and have to put lots of effort and attention into an unconscious response, we would be putting our lives at risk, okay? So think of the unconscious response. Think of spinal reflexes as basically being the body's survival mechanism or defense mechanism against danger and against harms that may occur to us. And as you can see here, the unconscious response is the complete opposite of the conscious response. It doesn't involve conscious awareness, doesn't involve a whole lot of attention. It's involuntary, which means that you don't really volunteer to do it, it just happens. Automatic, which means that again, you don't have much of a choice there. And reflexive in the sense that they're very rapid responses. They happen very reflexively or very rapidly, okay? That so much so that sometimes you haven't realized that you've moved your hand away from a sharp, a sharp object and it takes you a while to actually realize what happened, okay? So that's what a reflex action is. And you can see in this little comic thing here, this uh, person is about to step on or has probably scraped their foot against a pin and the reflex action has set into place there or has activated. Okay. So the brain is like, we've got to pull our feet away. And then it's like, shouldn't we think about this first? Okay. And the spinal cord is like, no, that's why it's called a spinal reflex because the movement doesn't have to um, be initiated by the brain. It's initiated by the interneurons in the spinal cord itself. Okay. That leads to a more rapid response as compared to getting the brain involved, which would be a little bit more time consuming and would put you more in harm's way compared to if the spinal cord was involved. Can we create a reflex or is it all inbuilt? Yes. They're, well, look, we've got two types of reflexes. We've got simple reflexes, which are like spinal reflexes. That's when you touch something that's very hot or when you step on something that's really um, sharp or get into contact with something that's sharp. Those are simple reflexes. Those don't require um, any learning, any prior learning. Those are inbuilt. We've also got conditioned reflexes. Conditioned reflexes are when you can teach someone to show fear in the, play, in, um, in the presence of something or you can teach someone or 
conditional get um, get someone to learn how to blink whenever they hear a bell so that is actually related to something called classical conditioning which we actually cover um, in unit three outcome two and classical conditioning is the process of teaching someone how to show a physiological response to something and there have been experiments or people are able to actually get someone to for example blink every time they hear the sound of a bell or um, in the main experiment we're going to look at um, this year, uh, one of these experimenters called Pavlov was actually able in the 1800s to um, get a dog to salivate every time a bell was rung. Um, and he was able to do this through continuously pairing the food presentation with the bell. So every time Pavlov would give the dogs the um, food bowl, he would ring a bell about half a second before he gave them the food, um, the food bowl. So the dogs were initially, um, eventually able to link the presentation or the being provided with the food with the ringing of the bell so even when the food wasn't present as soon as they heard the bell they started to salivate anyway that's in classical conditioning but that's an example of how yes reflexes can be learned and these are actually called conditioned reflexes okay these are different than what we've been going through today but we will be learning more about these later in the unit okay but not in this spread but later in the unit we will be so conditioned reflexes, meaning learned reflexes. Spinal reflex is not a learned reflex though. It's a naturally occurring or inbuilt or innate reflex, okay? That is there for our survival. Cool. Um, that's basically conscious and unconscious responses. Now, what is the role of the spinal reflex? We've already talked a little bit about the role, okay? In terms of the fact that it's our body's survival mechanism, it's really, really important for uh, protecting us from harm. So when you think about the spinal reflex, it's really important to always link it back to the overall purpose, okay? We say that it has an evolutionary and adaptive role, okay? When you see these words evolutionary or adaptive, you need to basically understand that this just means that the spinal reflex is important for our survival, okay? In this year's exam, there was a question about a girl who um, I think had touched something hot and how she moved her hand away really quickly. And then the question was something like, explain the purpose of the biological response. And Although a lot of students started talking about the whole process involved rather than talking about the actual purpose, the simple answer that was expected was that the girl moved her hand away really quickly because the spinal reflex has this adaptive role, that it does promote our survival. So that's just such a simple thing you have to write as opposed to including the whole process there. So it's always important to understand if you're ever asked for the purpose of the spinal reflex, you're literally just going to talk about that last point there. Okay, if you're asked to explain the biological processes, that's going to obviously be worth more marks. That's going to probably be worth three or four marks. So then you know you have to give the actual explanation there. So what is the actual explanation? Let's have a look at it now. Generally, what happens, guys, when we... Okay, I'll ask you guys this question. Now, if I want to normally move my hand to pick up something, not a, ref, not a reflexive response, if I just want to show a conscious motor response, where does the motor message begin? In which part of the body? Can anyone tell me in the chat box now, where would that motor message initially uh, begin or initiate? Which part of the body? Would it be the CNS? And if so, which part of the CNS? Okay, if you remember. Motor messages or movement related messages always start in the brain, yeah? Because obviously the destination has to be the body part that we're gonna move. So normally motor responses start in the brain, okay? Go down the spinal cord, I'm just gonna write SC, and then go to the body part, yeah? That's the general process for normal motor movements. This process is a little bit different though for the spinal reflex. In the spinal reflex, the brain no longer initiates the movement. It's the spinal cord that actually initiates the movement. You can see the spinal cord in this diagram and in, in the real body as well. The spinal cord is more proximate or more closer to the body than the brain is. So the interneurons within the spinal cord are able to initiate the automatic movement of the body, for example, moving a hand away from a rose thorn um, very quickly. And after this movement occurs, the message then, the sensory message then goes up to the brain 
telling that telling the person that okay that hurt or that was painful okay but by this point they've already moved their hand away from the dangerous stimulus so in other words in the spinal reflex the movement happens first so movement happens first and then the pain is felt afterwards Okay, this is important because only if the movement away from the harmful stimulus happens first, can we actually promote our survival. If we're going to feel the pain first and then decide whether we're going to move our hand, we're just exposing ourselves to more danger there. We're just prolonging our pain or our suffering, okay, and putting ourselves more at risk. So in other words, just to repeat, in the spinal reflex, the interneurons in the spinal cord send the automatic message or reflexive message to the body part that needs to be moved. And that leads to the automatic movement of the hand. Once the hand has moved away from the dangerous stimulus or from the rose thorn, that sensory message from the rose thorn then travels all the way to the brain, allowing you to then feel the pain. But by that point, we're all good because we've already moved our hand away. Okay, so that's the basic um, idea of what the spinal reflex is. And remember, it's called the spinal reflex because the motor message is initiated in the spinal cord, not the brain. Okay, because a spinal reflex is different from a conscious motor response, a conscious motor response where we're planning to do something like picking up a pen, that would obviously start in the brain, then go down the spinal cord, then go to your hand. Okay, it's really important that we're able to differentiate between these two processes, a conscious motor response um, as compared to a unconscious motor response. And remembering that the main unconscious motor response we need you guys to know is the spinal reflex. Um, now I'm going to go to the next slide and just show you guys a quick diagram that kind of visually represents what this looks like. This is taken from the old textbook that we used to use. Um, I think it's a good diagram because it just shows you kind of like um, a step-by-step -step process of how this works. You don't need to know it in this level of detail, but it's kind of like showing you the main kind of detail as to how it works because we don't have a lot of detail about this uh, spinal reflex in the Edrollo book, unfortunately. So it's the same process as what's on the previous slide, guys. So again, as long as you learn either this dot point here, okay, or the next slide, they're literally just describing the same thing, okay? Now, is there anything that's confusing about the process of how this happens? If there is, just let me know, or you can email me later as well. If there's anything confusing about any of these steps, um, yeah, just let me know and I'm happy to help you out. The main thing you need to remember, guys, is that in the spinal reflex, um, you move your hand away or you move the body part away first. That's the withdrawal reflex or that's the um, reflexive action. And you feel the pain afterwards. So in this example, if you're touching a hot pan and, you know, you forget to wear your oven gloves or you forget to wear protective gloves or whatever it is, and you're touching a hot pan, First, you move your hand away from the pan because of the interneurons in the spinal cord, which basically allow for that rapid movement to occur. And then um, only afterwards do you actually feel the pain of the heat from the pan, okay? But by that point, it's all good because you've already moved your hand away from the pan, okay? So that's the basic um, idea. Okay, we will do anyway some, oh, we've got a practice question here. Um, Look, I know it's still early days to do practice questions. This is actually taken from a really, really old exam. See if you can just list down the three steps. Well, you don't even have to number the steps. Just list down the main things you think would be involved or would happen if you were to have a pin prick to your finger, okay? Considering that this is a spinal reflex, the role of the spinal reflex, what are the three main steps that you think would occur? You can just write your answer in the chat box. Um, and then you can, yeah, we can see what you guys think. Maybe we'll start with the first thing that you think would occur. Okay, remembering guys that the movement occurs first. Okay, and Basically, the sensory information is held in your spinal cord until the movement has occurred. So it kind of waits there until the movement has occurred. And once the reflexive movement has occurred, that sensory message then goes from the spinal cord to the brain, then allowing you to feel the pain. 
Okay, I'll show you guys. I know this is a difficult topic, so I think I'll just show you guys what the sample response is or what the main three steps are, um, which are deliberately given in a bit of extra detail there, so to aid your understanding. So in step one, you can see that the sensory neuron takes that finger's neural impulse or the sensory information of the pain from that pin to the spinal cord. And then that information will kind of wait in the spinal cord, okay? The person's not ready to feel pain yet. They can only feel the pain once they've moved their hand away. Now from the spinal cord, this interneuron um, will then take that sensory message to the motor neuron in the brain. So the interneuron plays the main role now in initiating the movement. And then that rapid message is sent to the muscles, okay? And the brain's not involved yet. Remember, the interneuron is just directly communicating with the motor neuron at this point. They've met kind of at the halfway point. And then this prompts the person to make that necessary movement to really reflexively or rapidly move the finger away from the pin. And then after they've moved their finger away from the pin, the person will feel the pain only after they've moved their hand away from the harm or from the danger there. In this case, the harm or the danger is the pin, which is a sharp object. So those are kind of like the main three kind of things that are included, okay, in a question like this. Again, this is a really old question, so um, this is just to show you guys what are the basic steps involved, but nowadays we do more scenario type questions. So we will cover uh, more scenarios in class uh, once we get back on this topic, because this is a difficult um, topic. So if you're finding it hard, don't stress. Um, it is naturally or normally quite a confusing topic, okay, because there are a few sequences or steps involved there. Okay. Um, all right, so what we're going to do in the remaining time that we have is I want to go through some of the questions in the workbook. Maybe we can at least cover a few. So if you guys can open up the workbook on your end, I'll also open it up. Well, actually, I want to show you guys a video as well. I'm going to show you the video first. So let me just open that up. Okay, hopefully you guys can see the video. It's only a two minute one, but I think it explains the spinal reflex um, quite well. So have I screen shared? Yes, I have. Okay. So we'll just watch this and then maybe we will, we'll see how much time we have after that. Ouch. See how quickly I move my head from the hot stove. Our bodies have a system in place which enables us to react really quickly called reflex reactions. Reflex reactions are immediate, unconscious responses to a stimulus that provides us with protection and facilitates our survival. From our videos on the nervous system and nerve cells, you should already know about the stimulus, receptor, sensory neuron, central nervous system, motor neuron, effector pathway, and how sensory neurons, motor neurons, and relay neurons differ from one another. In this video, we are going to look at what happens in reflex reactions. Sorry, one, one thing I need to mention. Relay neurons, guys, are another word for interneurons. We call them relay neurons as well sometimes because they relay information between um, sensory and motor neurons, okay? So just keep that in mind. Touch a body plate, face to face with a lion, eye reacting to bright light, you want a fast reaction. When your safety demands quick response, the signals may bypass the brain acted upon as soon as they reach the spinal cord. These shorter pathways are called reflex arcs. Reflex arcs are built in for innate behaviors, and we all behave in the same way. Even though the brain is bypassed for the immediate response, the nerve message is still passed onto the brain so that you can think about whether any further action is needed. So the pathway has been cut down by speeding up the central nervous system aspect. The message reaches the spinal cord and heads straight back out down the motor neuron to produce a response. See what happens when you touch a hot object. There are two types of reflex. Simple reflexes, like we have seen already, where the brain is not aware of the initial response, this aids your survival. You can also have conditioned reflexes. These involve prior thought or learning. Your body responds subconsciously because of this. Pavlov's dogs is an example of conditioned learning. During his experiments, Pavlov rang a bell immediately before feeding the dogs. He found that after a while, the dogs would produce saliva just on hearing the bell without food being provided. Pavlov called this a learned response, which does not involve... 
Yep. So this is the example of the conditioned reflexes that we talked about before. They still involve a reflexive response or an automatic response like salivation, for example, but um, the dogs have to learn to salivate when they hear the bell. It's not something natural or innate. The natural response would be, um, you know, salivating when they smell the food or see the food there. Okay, so that basically gives you a quick summary of what the um, simple reflex arcs versus the conditioned reflexes are. So I think, guys, we'll, we'll continue the questions next week because we did cover quite a bit of content today. So next week we will look at the questions for 2B and 2C and then we'll start the rest of the content. But if you have any questions about the spinal reflex, just please email me and I'm happy to explain it to you in a different way. All right, enjoy the rest of your day and take care. See ya.